This morning, uh, you can keep your pens out if you want to take notes. We're going we're gonna to continue um, our series entitled Unlikely, talking about the many ways in which God shows up in a most unlikely way. Uh, first week, we took a look at God's unlikely provision, and then we took a look at God's unlikely presence. And this morning, as we uh, move forward, we're going we're gonna to take a, 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 a video of, or take a, a watch a video of um, some of our family here. Uh, that have been able to experience God's unlikely presence in the midst of the storms of life. Uh, Let's take a look at this. Peace, thank you, unlikely peace. Thank you. When I was a little girl, I was so afraid of death. The thought of being nothing forever horrified me. And I needed to know God. And no matter how much I went to church every Sunday and catechism, I learned about God, but I couldn't feel Him. Then, at the ripe old age of 18, I got married. And 11 months later, I gave birth to my first son, Ronald. He was eight pounds and such a joyful child to have. I loved being a mom. A year and a half later, I was six and a half months pregnant and my water broke. 24 hours later, I gave birth to my 12 inch, three pound baby boy, Peter, who was crying so softly. He had the perfect little body, little feet and toes and hands and fingers. The doctor baptized him right after he was born. And then the, as the doctor walked out with him, the baby was still crying and I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. And then within minutes, the doctor came back to tell me that my baby died. Well, not knowing God, I was so angry and so confused and so sad how could God let this happen? What kind of God are you? Three days later, we buried the baby. And by that time, I was so filled with sorrow, I didn't want to live. Thankfully, a neighbor came over and she read God's word to me. I didn't have my own Bible and there was so much in there that started to connect. And then when she laid her hands on me and prayed for me, the love of God just poured into my being and filled my soul with light. All the darkness was gone and my mind was like illuminated knowing there is a God, this is the God I've been searching for. And this was the beginning of a beautiful, long, loving, personal relationship relationship with the living God, something I wanted since I was as little as I could remember. One year later, I gave birth to my beautiful nine pound daughter, Jenny. And she was so beautiful. And the thoughts of losing Peter were so fresh in my mind that I cried at the beautiful gift that God gave me, a healthy, beautiful daughter. Six years later, I gave birth to my son, Michael, but something was terribly wrong. He just laid there, he wasn't breathing, and the doctors started to work on him, and I cried out, oh God, please, please don't take another son. And I wouldn't stop praying until one of the doctors called out, it's okay, it's okay, we got him, he's alive. When he was about five, my first husband left, but leaning on the Word of God, going to church, staying in Bible studies, praying all the time. I knew God had a plan and He would get me through this. In 1987, I married my handsome cowboy Ken and he had no children of his own, but he was so loving and patient with my three children. And when I was four and a half months pregnant with his first child, I started bleeding terribly. 
the doctors couldn't find a heartbeat. And um, 10 days later, I went into labor. When we were at the hospital, they had no room for us, so they left us in the hall where he and I would deliver my miscarriage baby. My husband and I left feeling so broken and confused and thankfully he was saved before we got married so we would pray together and read God's word and get his peace even in such a dark situation. Uh, two years later I gave birth to my nine pound, 13 and a half pound son, Kenny, my husband's one and only child that he treasures. It's, uh, Kenny is his love and joy and it's so beautiful to see that in a relationship. When Kenny was about eight years old, uh, we were both home and two detectives knocked on my door. And they came in and they told me that my son Michael was in a car accident. And I said, well, how is Michael? And they said he died. I screamed. I could not comprehend not being able to see Michael that he died in a car accident. By the time Michael was laid out at the funeral hall, I had such a peace I couldn't believe could happen. I was thinking how when I lost Peter, how God filled me with his love. And then I remembered when Michael was born, he was still born. And the doctors had to work on him to get him back and God gave him back to me so that I could love and adore him for 17 years. So how can I not praise God and thank him? I never got to know Peter. Michael, I got to know and love. And yes, it's better to it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. My husband, Ken, and I have come to know that no matter what happens, we're going to trust God and He's going to fill us with His peace. And we just have to try not to be shocked and upset and horrified when things go wrong because you just don't know what's around the corner. We're going to trust in Him. We're going to love Him. We're going to be filled with His peace and His light and His love and His joy. Joy does come in the morning. God's unlikely peace, it comes in the most unusual of ways, in times that we wouldn't think possible. We've seen His unlikely presence, his unlikely provision. And as we've been able to kind of take a snapshot and look at the journey that, that Gene and Ken have been in, we've, we've been able to see God's presence in a way that we'd never think we can endure. This morning as we continue, we're going to take a look at that God's un, un, unlikely peace um, in the most difficult of circumstances. Anybody ever been through a difficult circumstance before? Um, yeah, I think we've all been through those seasons uh, where of difficulty and trial. And um, those, those, those concerns that we have sometimes, we think we'd never be able to endure, you know, fill in the blank. And sometimes, sometimes we never have to endure it, but sometimes we do. But what we end up finding is that in the midst of those things, God comes alongside us, and his presence brings a peace that Paul calls a peace that surpasses our, our own understanding. And so to kind of get a look at this idea of, of, of peace this morning, we're going to kind of unpack a little story that takes place right in the book of Judges. If you have your, your Bible this morning, turn with me to Judges chapter 6, and we are introduced uh, to a young man by the name of, of Gideon. And we're going to see how God um, really meets Gideon uh, in a very difficult time in, in his journey, as well as the journey for the people of Israel. Look with me at, Gen at Judges chapter 6 and verse 1. Judges 6 and verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil 
in the sight of the Lord. Now, usually when we open up with that pat, with, with a line like that, you know something good is not about to happen, is, is about to happen, or not good is about to happen, right? So the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now, let's just stop there for, for a minute. We, we can't help but see um, the sovereignty of, of God in the current situation that Israel found themselves in. You see, the one who was, was in control of the situation over Israel was not the Midianites. It was God. God used the Midianites as a tool to draw Israel back to himself. What it doesn't say here is that the, the Midianites just attacked Israel and took, and, and took control. God gave them over. And you know, there are times where consequences to situations like that, where, they, where they're, they're living in disobedience and it brings, it brings a clear consequence. And those are a little bit easier to kind of figure out. And, but it's when, we, when there's not that kind of a situation. When we think of somebody like Job, who, who Job was a righteous man and was, was having to face difficult times, it wasn't a result of his own sin, it wasn't a result of his turning on God. I think of our brother and sister this morning and, and think surely that was not a result or a consequence for anything they had done. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust and, and, and there are difficult times that, that all of us are, are going to endure that aren't the direct reflection of anything we've done. I, I grieve sometimes when I, when I hear, hear people say, if someone's going through a difficult time or a certain kind of sickness or whatever, that was well, because they did this and if they'd only have enough faith or they just trust, it's like, who are you to question the sovereign God of the universe? How dare you? We need to recognize that God, hey, God can heal. God can raise the dead. God can do whatever God chooses to do. But if he chooses not to do that, it does not bring his question, into question his love and his care and his sovereignty over our lives. Amen? And so for this morning, as we consider Gideon, we recognize that the people of Israel are going through a really difficult time because of something Israel did. They had done evil in the sight of the Lord. You see this, as, and, and because of that, God turns them over to the Midianites. This is not a picture of a malicious God. Instead, this is a picture of a God who cares so much for Israel that he will use something like the tool of a Midian, the Midianites, to bring them back into fellowship with God, the God who loves them and cares for them. And so as we continue, let's take a look at verse two. And it says, And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and, and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and they'd leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents and they would come like, they would come like locusts in number. There would be so, so many of them. Both they and their camels could not even be counted. There were so many that came against Israel so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. And so I just want to give you a little snapshot of what's going on before we kind of jump into the story of Gideon. We need to recognize the context of what's going on. They are in the midst of a very difficult time. I mean, the mission was accomplished, right? We see that in the midst of that, they, they, their attention is grabbed, right? They kind of turn back to God. They recognize that they are in a, in a dependent relationship, right? That the creation is in need of relationship with the creator, and so they turned to God for help. But there must have been an, it must have been an extremely difficult time for Israel. Those seven years were, were full of, of, of chaos. They're hiding in caves. They're, they're running for their lives. 
They were, they were hungry. They had no resources. And, and when it, just when it seemed like they were able to grow something and develop some resources of their own, the, the Midianites and the Amalekites would show up and, and take it from them. Surely they were going through a, a difficult time. This is a, a picture of, of chaos and, and desperation for the, the people of God. It was a time of, of tremendous need for the people. That's the backdrop, but thankfully that's, that's not the end of the story. But the backdrop is really important for us to understand. Because what that does is, it, is they turn back to God. And God responds. Because God always responds when people turn to him. God never says no. God never says it's too late. God never says enough. God always responds. And so they turn back to God and God responds to them. Look with me in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the terebinth at Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. I love this, this is great. So here's Gideon, right? He's, he's out working in the fields. He's, he's with his dad. He's doing whatever he could to kind of help survive, right? He's kind of hiding what he can so that they can be able to make bread and, and survive as a people. But here they are. It, 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 seems, it seems like nothing seems to be working for them as a people. I mean, they're, they're hungry, right? They're, they've, they've had years of, of being in want, years of running and hiding in caves and, and holes, and the Lord, in the, in, in the midst of that, appears to Gideon. That's why, that's why context is so important. I mean, you could just jump right into the story of Gideon and, and miss the backdrop. But when you can appreciate the backdrop, you really can understand the impact and even the questions that might arise in this young man, Gideon. And so in the midst of the chaos, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, you mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. And notice the response of Gideon. He says, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? That's uncomfortable. He's one of our Bible heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. If the Lord is with us, Why, why have you let this happen? Where are all his wonderful deeds that, are, that our fathers recounted to us? We had heard stories about God stepping up and, and delivering his people. We had, we had heard our fathers and our grandfathers tell about the mighty works of God. Where have you been? If you're for us and you're with me, why has all this happened to us? He says, did, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? I mean, he delivered us from bondage only to be under the bondage of the Midianites and the Malachi. God, where are you? Is his cry. What a question to ask God. And he draws the conclusion, but Lord, the Lord has, has forsaken us. And he's given us into the hand of Midian. What a question that he asks God. I, mean, I, just, I just want that to kind of settle in for a minute. God, if you're really for us, why am I going through what I'm going through? Why is life so difficult? Can I, can I just tell you this morning that, that God is not set back by your questions? This does not God off of his throne. God loves when his children are in touch with what they're feeling and they feel safe enough to express it to God. He's omniscient. He knows everything there is to be known about everything. And so we are not informing him in any way when we bring our questions 
but we are expressing the intimacy of our heart and the, the concerns and fears of our hearts. And that's what, what Gideon is doing. He's being very real and saying, God, if, if you're with us, why has all this happened to us? Maybe that's been your prayer. Maybe that's been your question. Maybe it's that question that you know you're not supposed to say to anybody else because it sounds like it just reeks of lack of faith. But you look at your circumstances and you look at the things around you and you think to yourself, how in the world can a loving God allow this to happen? Is it not the question of the world around us? In a time where chaos seems to be breaking out in every neck of the woods in our, in our country, how they love to ask that question and how they love to mock those who would call us to prayer, call the country to prayer. How they love to ask that, if God is really a God of love, then how could he allow this to happen? We see it coming off the lips of Gideon, and it continues right on to this day. And I want to tell you, I want to encourage you this morning, it's okay to have a question. God knew that the question was in Gideon's heart even before he looked at him and said, you mighty man of valor. At this point in Gideon's life, he has only experienced hardship. And the thought of, of God using him, because God is going to use him and raise him up to Restore the people. Knock over the prophets of Baal. Bring strength and freedom back to the people. And God is tapping this young boy, this young man, to do what he just did not think he had the tools to do. And so God approaches this young man, and what it does is it reveals some real insecurities and fear in Gideon's life. Gideon came, comes face to face with his limitations, very much aware that he is not capable of doing what he believes God is calling him to do. God saw a mighty man of valor Gideon saw something to the contrary. Look with me at verse 15, and, and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan, my family, is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the weakest in my family. You're at the bottom of the barrel. You're tapping the wrong guy. I don't have what's needed to get the job done. My family can't do it, and I certainly can't do it either. What we see coming out of Gideon is fear. There's no way, God. I can't do it. I'll die. We see fear. But look at the Lord's response. But Gideon, I will be with you, Gideon. And you will strike the Midianites as one man. God, I'm afraid. I can't do it. I'm the weakest in my family. We're the weakest in all of Manasseh. And God's like, but Gideon, listen, but I will be with you. I'm not calling you to do something that I'm not going to empower you and hold your hand and walk you through. You're not going to do this alone, Gideon. I will be with you. What encouraging words we see from God. When you're forced to face the biggest challenge of your life, we can, we can draw from that reminder that God will never bring you to a place that his presence will not go with you that no matter what season you might find yourself in, whether it's the darkest of days of your life, you will never be in a season that keeps God out of the equation. He will always walk with you. He will never leave you. And Jesus said, he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. 
You never go through. And so what he's telling to Gideon is he's recognizing, Gideon, I know you're afraid. I know you feel weak. I know you have insecurities. But Gideon, I'm going to raise you up because, boy, you're a mighty man of valor. And I'm going to walk through this with you. What takes place has stretched the minds of readers for years as they continue to see uh, Gideon in action through the book of Judges. Because not only does Gideon question God's choice of him, he begins to test God along the way. It's ironic because here he is and the angel of the Lord shows up in his presence. And you'd think that just the presence of the angel of the Lord would have been enough to suggest that God was going to bring him through. But he wants signs. He wants further confirmation. He wants further proof that God is going to do what God wants him to do. He is so riddled with fear. Can I tell you that, that fear will cause you to do the most irrational of things? Fear will cause you to see things that do not exist. They will cause you to hear things that haven't been said. They will cause you to feel things that aren't real. Your fear might even give you the, a doctrine, a doctorate at, at being, a, 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 um, being able to diagnose the cancer in your body. Fear has a way of controlling the way we think if we allow it. And as we, as we see Gideon here, Gideon, he wants a sign. Why? Because his, his, his fear was screaming louder than the voice of the Lord. Gideon's fear was screaming louder than what God was saying to him. And so instead of listening and embracing what God was saying, he wanted more proof. He wanted more evidence. He wanted more confirmation. You been there? Aren't you thankful that God's patient? I thank God that he, he, is, he is patient and recogn- he knows my frame. Oh, dear God, I thank him for that. He knows my insecurities. He knows my fears. He knows my weaknesses. He knows, he knows me. And he, he knows how to meet me right where I'm at. That's what he does with Gideon. Gideon recognizes he's in the presence of the angel of the Lord. He's like, all right, wait, just, just stay right here. I'm going to go home because he must have had a little bit of a tie-in in him because he's like, I got to cook you something. Got to cook you something, right? Got to have. So he's like, you just stay put right here. I'm going to go home. And so he runs home. He grabs some meat. He grabs some bread, right? And, and he heads and some broth and he heads back to the angel. <laughs> Gotta love this stuff. And I love what we see taking place here because what the angel of the Lord says to him is like, all right, you, you want some more proof? Here's what I want you to do. Take the bread. Take the meat. And put it on the rock. And I want you to saturate it with broth. Make it really wet because wet things don't burn. And so... He does as he's told to do, and what we see happening is at that point, it says, look with me here, it says, uh, the, the angel, verse 21, and then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock. How cool is that? Anybody ever see a rock on fire before? The, the, the uh, fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. You want a sign, Gideon? Here's a sign for you. God meets him right where he's at. But we have this young boy. He, man, he's riddled with fear. He's riddled with all kinds of limitations that he put on himself. And you see, he didn't see himself as the mighty man of valor that God saw in him. And that's what fear will do to us. It will cause you to redefine who God says you are. Fear. It's false evidence appearing real. That's what it means. That's what it is. False evidence appearing real. 
It causes us to see things that, don't, that, that, that aren't to be seen, hear things that aren't being said, feel things that aren't real. It can, if we allow it, it can completely drive us, say it with me, crazy. I like what um, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. He says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you for you trust in him. I love that. You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Notice, he doesn't say whose heart is stayed on you. It's whose mind. See, from our heart, man, we love God. In our heart, we know God can show up. In our heart, we know God is big. In our heart, we know God will take care of everything. It's not, the battle is not in our heart. The battle is in our mind. That's where the stinking thinking starts taking place. That's when the questioning starts taking place. That's where the fear begins to sprout all kinds of thoughts and reactions and, and everything else. It's in our minds. And what he says here is, you'll keep him in perfect peace. How many want to walk in perfect peace? God is not throwing out a hypothetical that we can't walk in. He's saying, here's, if you want to walk in perfect peace, he'll, he'll walk in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Can I tell you, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, my family, guard your mind. Don't allow any thought to just begin to, begin to um, grow in your mind and take control of the way you think. Paul says we are to take captive every thought. We need to guard our mind like we guard the most precious valuables we have. And when those thoughts come in, and they come in, don't they? Usually in the middle of the night when things are really quiet, those thoughts, those whispers, the remnants of conversations, the accusations of others, the, whatever it may be, they start to, we start to rehearse them in the quietness of the night. And it's in those, when we start feeding that and we start speaking into that and, and, and allow it to begin to, to taint the way we see God, see ourselves and see other people, it becomes a stronghold in a way of thinking. That's why Gideon's like, listen, I'm the, my family's the weakest and I'm the weakest in my family. I know that because obviously that's what I've been thinking about. He'd already concluded that he was incapable of being used by God. And I just want to encourage you to do what I've got to do all the time. Take captive, arrest those thoughts that are contrary to what God says about you, that are contrary to what God wants to do in you, that are contrary to who God has made you to be, and don't allow those things to settle there. I heard somebody once say, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from making a nest there. Was that you, Mom? It might have been. If not, I'll own it. I've always said. <laughs> Guard your mind. The mind informs the heart. And so Gideon, yay God for having patience with Gideon. The sacrifice is received and Gideon recognizes that God's going to be with him. That's a sign. Verse 22 says, and Gideon perceived about time, Gideon. Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, and, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. It's very interesting. You read the story of Gideon, and you think that the issue that Gideon had was, was one of doubt. <laughs> But really, that wasn't his biggest problem. You see, the fear feeds the doubt. That's why the response of the angel was, was not, hey, don't doubt. It's, hey, don't fear. You shall not die. He puts his finger on the one thing that, that has the potential of holding Gideon back, his fear, false evidence appearing real. 
And God is going to bring Gideon on a journey that, man, he's going to have to really trust God to see God do some really big things. And boy, does he ever. I'd encourage you to read the story of Gideon. But let's be honest, Gideon had plenty of reasons to worry. Gideon had, had plenty of reasons to be fearful. He had seen the Midianites and the, and the Malachites bring all kinds of devastation upon his people. I mean, he had, he had some history. He had seen his family have to run and hide in the caves and in the holes and have to wonder where the next food is going to come from. He had seen their goods taken away. He had seen the cupboards empty and he had seen hope squashed. He knew what it was to be in a dark day, but... But in the midst of that, a very unlikely thing happens to Gideon. God shows up. And God tells him, you're not a victim. You're a mighty man of valor. Stand up and recognize who you are, Gideon. You're a mighty man of valor. He need not fear anymore. He need not run anymore. He doesn't need to hide anymore. God would replace all those fears in Gideon with peace. Look at verse 24. And in the midst of all the stuff that's going on, Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shalom. It's the only time in the Old Testament we see that name attributed to God. It was in the midst of a storm. It was in the midst of a scary time. It was in the midst of a time when they were in need and desperate and turning back to God. And God goes in and says, I will, st I will step up and I will be there for you for I am your peace. Jehovah Shalom. You see, the pattern that we see in the Old Testament is that the names of God that are, that are, are, that are attributed to God are really revelations of himself to the, person, to, to the person that is on the receiving end of that. You see, God could have just told Gideon that I'm the God, you're peace, but instead he allowed Gideon to experience and come to the conclusion himself that God, you, are my peace. He built an altar there. Why? Because it'd be a place that he'd have to return back to and be reminded. Jehovah Shalom. God showed himself to be Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace to Gideon as he replaces fear with peace. It's a peace that Paul says surpasses on our own understanding. That in the darkest of times, in the most difficult of times, there is for the child of God a peace that is reserved for the child of God. And we always need to be very careful to never draw conclusions as to why God is doing what he's doing. Certainly not for, our, you know, for ourselves and certainly not for anybody else. But what we do know is this. We do know that no matter what we're going through, God will never leave us. And if God is allowing difficulty to come into our life, he's gonna use it for his glory and he's gonna use it for our good. And sometimes those circumstances will change. Sometimes they won't. I know that's not what the TV preacher told you. He said, if you just give enough, We don't know the mind of God. We don't always know the why. That's why we must embrace the who. We must embrace the heart of God. We must understand that even in the midst of those times, God will walk through the hardest of times. I could not imagine having to go with what my brother and sister had to go through. <clears throat> Couldn't imagine. Wouldn't even allow my, I won't even allow myself to think like that. But I do know this. Whatever God calls us to do, he will always be there with us. He'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. And there's that, that peace that comes with his presence. I wish I could give concrete answers as to why. But we just don't know. 
every tragedy our culture experiences, they're so quick to question, well, God, why? People who are listening on TV or the internet, and they listen to that. Every, that's the first thing they say. Well, if you're, if you're so loving, then, then, then why? We need to recognize that the things that, that we experience in this world, all of the pain and the chaos and the hatred and the murder, and it was not designed like that. That wasn't the way God designed the world to go. And when sin entered in the world because of disobedience from man, the consequences of that sin have affected every area of our lives. That doesn't dilute the power and sovereignty of God. It only affirms the fact that God had a plan that man chose not to obey. And the consequences of those things are seen in the fallen world in which we live. We're living, we live in a world that is, that is marred. What God called good before the fall has been marred after the fall. And just because we are his children doesn't mean that we're not gonna receive some of the rain. As the scripture says, it rains on the just and the unjust. It doesn't mean we're not gonna experience hardship, but it does mean that he'll be with us in the midst of it. We see the reality is we need to recognize that while that may be our experience here, there's, there's, there's coming a day where all the consequences of sin, all of the pain, all of the anger, all of the hurt, all of the, all of the hatred and the murder, and all of that are going to be done away with. And all things will be made new. All things will, will, will be refocused back into the way God designed for it to be. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, I think it was, where he says we need to put on our helmet, on our head, the hope of our salvation. That we, we need to recognize that no matter what's going on in the world around us, listen, you and I weren't created for this world. We were created to be with God for all eternity. And there's going to be a time where we step out of time and into eternity. And all of the chaos and the consequences of sin are going to be gone. John, the apostle, got a, got a picture of this while he was on the island of, 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 of Patmos in exile. It is after the, the false prophet and the, the antichrist and the, the fallen angels and, and Satan himself are kicked into the lake of fire. What a great and glorious day that's going to be. I love that Isaiah talks about when, when that day comes, those who are with God are going to look at it and say, is this the man, speaking of Satan, is this the one who shook the nations, really? That's it. But it is after that, here is John, he's in exile on the island of Patmos, and he sees in a vision that God gives them the, 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 the false prophet and, and the antichrist and the angels and, and, and Satan kicked into the lake of fire. And then he says, he opens up 21 by saying, and then after that, after sin is gone and the consequences are gone and all of that was against God, once that is removed, he said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was, was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. That's what we were designed for. Creator and creation walking with God together. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore. Why? For the former things have passed away. The consequences of sin that have caused the chaos in the world around us 
be gone. And we will be forever with the Lord. That's the hope of our salvation. That's what's waiting for us. But until that time, in the midst of the questions, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the tears, we will plead, we will beg, we will pray that God changes our circumstances. But if he does not, we can rest assured that his peace will be there and his grace will carry us through the darkest of circumstances. Because what he said to Gideon, he says to you, I will be with you. Don't be afraid. I'll be with you. Father, we thank you that that you give a peace that surpasses our own understanding. As we think of our brother and sister and the journey that they've been on that has caused many tears. I know, Lord, you've bottled up every one of those tears. You're aware of every one of them. But I thank you that you have been with them and that in the darkest of time that you bring peace. I pray for those that are here this morning that are struggling right now, faced with things that are overwhelming to think about that that might even cause them to say, God, if you're with me, why are things so difficult? I pray, God, that your, your peace would just overwhelm them. And that in the midst of that, that that would scream louder than the circumstances they find themselves in. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in our life. We thank you that you're committed to us. We thank you that we've been created for eternity. It's been, you've put eternity in our hearts. It doesn't stop here on this earth. But for, but for the child of God, it continues forever in your presence. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.